heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Welcome to a special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from Bloomberg Screen Time in Los Angeles. Coming up this hour, we'll bring you conversations from some of the biggest names in the entertainment industry. So today we're going to be speaking with top celebrities, entrepreneurs, moguls across what is a changing media landscape. And we're starting with Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw, the managing editor who leads Screen Time. Our, our own coverage. celebrity. Exactly. And Screen Time is, is the coverage of popular culture. It is a huge global industry and it kicked off last night with Live Nation, Mike Rapino. And I came to realize something sitting in the audience that Live Nation is peerless. If you think about its business, concerts is one facet of it around the world. It was such an engaging conversation. Honestly, it was a CEO of a company that was refreshingly honest. You did the interview, you talk about it. Where do you want to go with that? Well, look he, to your point, he has no peers. And I think he also serves sort of like a founder. Like, mm -hmm. I find that founders are more candid in interviews because they kind of don't care. They don't have as many people to answer to. And he's been running that business now for almost 20 years. Right. They are the biggest concert promoter in the world by a wide mile. They're the biggest ticket seller because they're ticket master by a lot. He knows that. He's confident. He has relationships with every artist. When they want to know what should I do with my tour, they call him. Yeah. And so he can be a little, you know, he can poke fun at the government, which is suing him right now. He can do things like that in a way that I don't think other CEOs can. But he can poke the bear, but the bear wants to split up this <laughs> size and scale that he's managed to build up. And so what was his reaction to all of this? Well, I thought it was interesting. I asked him at a, to, as a way to sort of get into the DOJ question if he would sell Ticketmaster, which is something mm. that the DOJ would like him to do, right? They want to break up Live Nation and Ticketmaster, which is sort of where this all started with a merger many years ago. And he's like, some days, yes, because Ticketmaster is the biggest pain for him. That's when fans get mad, when tickets don't get sold. Uh, but if you talk to anyone at the company, they're pretty confident that they're going to win this DOJ suit because they don't think that the DOJ really understands the music business. Mm. And I think if they were being honest, they're also maybe kind of hoping that the, the people in charge of the DOJ will be different by the time this is done. So what you did well, and, and if you're just joining us, right, what, what we're talking about is media and entertainment, but a, but a company that's been in the headlines because of Taylor Swift and then Oasis, but they kind of have two parts of their business and you, you helped us learn about that. There's ticketing and then I think promotion. Yeah. Just Live, explain it. So Live Nation is a concert promoter. That means that they're the people who are in charge of putting on a show. Right. When you're a promoter, you make very little money because the artist keeps almost all of the ticket sales. Which seems fair or equitable? Or? Yeah, totally. They, the promoter can make money from merchandise, can make money from food and beverage, that sort of thing. They also own a ticket seller. Ticket sellers similarly don't make very much money from the actual tickets being sold. They make their money from the fees. But when we're talking about profit margins, contra promotion is a very low margin business. Ticket selling is a better business. Live Nation, you add in advertising, which they do. They sell sponsorships. And ticketing and advertising is actually where they make most of their money. But the promotion is sort of the meat of the business. And so the whole package works really well. But it's also something that, that some people feel is unfair. We're going to be listening to part of that interview that you conducted last night in a moment. But push us forward to today. We are currently sat in L.A. It's about to get fiercely hot. It's going to get crowded in here. And ex with excitement, you've got others in the music industry. Scooter Ron, for example. Yeah, I, I really hope it's not too hot today, but it is a concern. Look, Scooter doesn't do very many interviews. Uh, he's had a pretty tumultuous couple of years. There was sort of this period where he basically stopped managing a lot of his biggest clients, Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande. It was sort of reported as they fired him. I think it was sort of a conscious uncoupling in the, in the, the term of Gwyneth conscious. Paltrow and, uh, and Chris Martin. Um, but I'm very excited to talk to him about that and about sort of discovering talent and how that works because there's mm. a lot of concern uh, that it's hard for artists to break out right now. We've got so many great conversations coming up. Sean Evans, you'll be listening to Matt Stone. Cannot wait for that conversation all about South Park. Lucas Shaw. What a legend who's currently running this event for us. We thank him. Meanwhile, look, those panels actually did kick off yesterday, as we we're saying. Let's just listen to a little bit of that conversation with the CEO of Live Nation, Michael Rapino, who says they actually want resale prices to be capped. Listen in. Unfortunately, those 10 times a year, um, when you have 10 million people trying to buy a million Oasis tickets, you know, there's no nice way to tell 9 million 
passionate fans, sorry, the store is closed. Um, so, you know, that, that creates lots of tension. And they go online and they see, they see, you know, 10 pages of secondary tickets and they get pissed off. If you had a magic wand or you were, you were sort of named emperor for the day and you could change, just change ticketing however you wanted, what would you do? Well, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great question. The problem is professional bots all around the world. You know, we got hit by multi-billions of bots on the Oasis on sale. Right. You know, so they're a, they're a professional $12 billion business trying to capture all those seats. Right? So it's an arms race with us trying to stop them, not let them in the door, let, not let them hold the tickets. You shouldn't have a middleman that has nothing invested in the business make any money from it. Yeah. So we would love it regulated in some sense, cap it at 20%. Some people can make a little money. That would be the biggest part that we get the most tension on the on sale is that. Right. That was Live Nation CEO Michael Rapino, and it was refreshingly honest in that conversation with Lucas Shaw. Many yeah. more conversations like that coming up throughout the day. Okay, on this program, Bloomberg Technology, we're going to talk video generation in the context of AI and much more with Runway CEO Chris Laval of Valenzuela. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology on the road, screen time, Los Angeles, Hollywood. If you're just joining us, this is Bloomberg Technology on the road in Hollywood at screen time. Runway is using AI to revolutionize the entertainment industry. The company's teamed up with Lionsgate Studios to build AI models and now has backing to produce dozens of films, movies, literally. Let's talk about it. Runway CEO Christopher Valenzuela joins us. And that deal, how real is it? <laughs> the process, the production of making a film in partnership using your technology? Yeah, so it's a first of its kind kind of deal. Um, and the idea behind it really is to take the Lionsgate team further with the technology. Like we're at the crossing point where AI is becoming really useful for filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And so what we really wanna make sure is that we help creative filmmakers, artists, studios, really understand how to use it in the best way possible. Um, and so what we did with Lionsgate, it's I think uh, something we've been trying to do for a long time basically to bridge the gap between AI and Hollywood and bring this technology in much more accessible ways but, to but many filmmakers. Christopher, as you know, I love the detail of, yes. of things. Are we talking about uh, filmmakers at Lionsgate sitting at a computer using your, your, your software exactly, yeah, yeah. as part of their process? Yeah, that's kind of the point. There's many tasks in the development of a movie where you can embed um, AI or our models and make that cheaper and faster, right? Okay. So if you're iterating through storyboarding or previsualizations or visual effects, you can use our models um, and filmmakers are now understanding how to use these models in ways that are very useful for them, right? I think that's the key aspect of it, which is for a long time, it has been seen as this uh, kind of like system that creates movies on its own, right? right? And it's really not like that. It's really a tool for directors and filmmakers. And with the Lionsgate deal, what we really want to make sure they, they understand is that they can take that further for their movies and becomes a really cost-effective tool to use. So again, if you're spending hundreds of uh, uh, dollars in making a shot, mm -hmm. in making a visual effects uh, a scene, you can now use Runway to kind of reduce that cost and move faster and, and, and to better results. You've been improving your models. Yes. How costly does that become um, and well, remain? There's definitely research that has to be done to train the models on the first end, but then tra uh, running the models and using them has become much more uh, cost effective over time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're yet at the point where you will see an optimization. Like, we're going to optimize the models even more, so the cost of running them will be even cheaper and faster. Let's just talk a little bit about, therefore, as you're building your offering, you're winning over new clients like Lionsgate. We think about where we were this time last year. We think about Hollywood in strike mode because, in large part, because right. artificial intelligence. Yeah. What sort of conversations have you had to have to get people comfortable with this technology? Well, the first thing that I think it's important to remember is that Hollywood is the history of technology. Like, we are here because of a yeah. technological breakthrough, Come right? On. And so we, we sometimes forget that art and technology kind of like come together always. And for us, it's like this may define a little bit the technology. Again, if you understand AI as a tool for humans, then it changes the narrative. And it's less about fearing it and more about embracing it. And you realize how you can actually use it. 
And I think uh, what we need to do right now is kind of like educate more and show the potential. There's also challenges of the technology. It's not a perfect kind of technology. It's not mm -hmm. a perfect tool. There are things that are not exactly uh, working as they should, but that's kind of the point. As you, you need to improve them and make it even better. And I think uh, part of it is just like uh, uh, showing more people, more producers, more Hollywood uh, studios, really the potential of it and, and use it. Christopher, Caroline and I use text to text, text to image, text to video tools every day. I love technology, <laughs> but I also just love film. Yeah. And there comes a point where I just want to ask if AI really can give the same feeling, create film and movie and content that is as authentic as the great filmmakers can make it with their hands and their eyes and camera. What do you think about that? Well, the, the interesting thing is um, filmmaking and stories and art are never really about the technology, are about conveying a feeling and emotion, are about connecting with the viewer and, telling, and making you feel something, right? You never watch a movie because how it was made, right? Or the cameras that were used to make the movies, right? You Unless watch... you're a real nerd like <laughs> me, yeah. <laughs> yes, but, but maybe even though, like, after the fact that you've liked the movie, right? You can go deeper into how it was made, but 99% of the world watches a movie because they, they feel something, because they connect with it. And so AI, if you think about it as a tool, can help you kind of connect with your audience, can help you deliver that message, can help you tell a story. Yes. Um, and so right now I think we're fascinating by the technology itself because it is fascinating. It's revolutionary, it's changing the game, it's incredibly new and exciting. But at the same time, if you want to uh, focus on art and filmmaking, it's important that we switch the narrative to storytelling, to people and how they use it and how they convey stories with technology and less about how which AI or which technology was used behind the scenes. You've been telling stories to raise money. And you've got some really yes. interesting investors because not many of them are going to be in the world of art and creation. In fact, you've got NVIDIA, Salesforce. What do they want to see out of you? Why do you have these sort of strategic investors coming on like an NVIDIA and what do they earn you? Well, I think they are, they are telling stories and their users are also telling stories. Like, again, we've, you can think about storytelling as Hollywood, as media, as films. But okay. if you think about companies, companies are also telling stories when they're advertising, when they're doing marketing, when they're communicating with the users. And so if you can help them also deliver better messages, then that's also a form of storytelling. Perhaps it's not as the art kind of like form, but it's still like a form of video. And we want to make sure we can work with companies like that that are uh, great and have been great partners for us for a long time. For at least a year, I've been hearing about Runway and your name comes up a lot. OpenAI has Sora. On the show in the last week, we talked about Meta's new tool. Yeah. But you have a very uh, singular focus. Where do you think you stand in your competence and as a business relative to that competition of OpenAI and Meta? Yeah, look, when we, when we started this seven years ago, um, it was a very new field. And I think we've proven over time that it's a really exciting and worthwhile time, uh, field to spend time in. It's an industry that's growing and it's changing. And I think when you create a market and you create a good opportunity, you will have competition. I think it's, uh, it's uh, unreal to think that no one else will try to build what we're building. But at the same time, we're very much in the long-term horizon strategy. Like everything we're building is not really about video today. It's around everything else that we can build to create better tools for storytellers all over the world. And so video is only a first kind of like stepping stone, but we're working towards audio, towards images, towards 3D, just a collective system, a collective set of tools and AI systems that can help you in all forms of storytelling that you want to tell. Will you raise some more money for that long term? Uh, we will have to do whatever we have to do to oh, deliver come on. that mission. <laughs> you you, you um, will have to, won't you? We're, we've been kind of like raising almost uh, every year from now since we started seven years ago. And an IPO? Uh, we're remain? just focused on building right now. We always want to know those sorts of things. <laughs> Runway CEO Cristobal Valenzuela. What a joy to have him live from Los Angeles. He's obviously New York based, so we'll be flying back there soon. But coming up, we'll be joined by Needham Senior Entertainment Analyst, Laura In the Martin. Flesh, unbelievable. I know, we get to have her really here sitting next to her to talk about the state of show business across entertainment, across streaming. Where's the profit? Where's the cost? We'll talk it all. This is Bloomberg Technology. We've given you the founder take.
from LA. But let's get the anal analyst take now on yep. the future of entertainment, the intertwining of generative AI and the competition we're seeing when it comes to streaming and the like. We need a senior entertainment analyst, Laura Martin. We're so excited to meet you here in the flesh. Finally, after all this time, yeah. lovely to be here. And you were just here listening to what Christabel was talking about in terms of the runway deal, working with Lionsgate. And for you, how much is generative AI changing up the game of the companies you cover? You know, I think it's changing it a lot. I see it most in my tech-first companies because they have to adopt generative AI. These content storytelling companies, I think, are going to be a little slower because you watch consumers watch movies because of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. But I think generative AI opens up whole creative uh, windows. Let me just jump in and say for our Bloomberg Technology audience, you cover public equities, but I it's do. tech companies, but also some of the media and entertainment names. Yes. And I, let's give that context and go from there, Karen. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important. I think we don't know how much it's going to affect Hollywood because the st because under the strikes, they prohibited the use of generative AI for three years of their right. deals. So it won't affect Hollywood quite as quickly, at least the big studios. But I think runway is going to be really important to the future of entertainment. To the future of hiring? I mean, how much do you start to see this becoming a profit right. generator to a certain extent because they're able to strip out costs? So, since we're sitting in Hollywood, I'll be respectful of the mm -hmm. guilds and say that I think what it first does first is open up new areas of creativity, right. just like animation unleashes is created to because you can draw anything. I think that's what what uh, generative AI does over time. Mm -hmm. What I am hearing from companies that are in the tech world that are adopting generative AI is they think they can cut costs where it applies in um, in segments where it applies by twenty to thirty percent. The, the, the players are different. I think it's been so interesting to be here with. Caroline for 24 hours, go to the studios to drive past Warner Brothers, be on the Disney lot, and, and actually learn a bit about the history, and then consider the money that they're deploying to try and either catch up with Netflix, frankly, <laughs> um, or try and do something a bit different. Caroline had a fantastic conversation on stage with Amazon last night in the context of Prime. You cover those names. Which do you think is ahead? Um, well, if we're talking about winners, clearly. I, and, I, and I'm talking about video, you know, entertainment in the context of film and television. YouTube won. We're done. Wow. Okay. Amazon's next. Amazon's on the prowl. It's coming up. Mm -hmm. But uh, why, why YouTube won. Why do you think won. YouTube won? That's a definitive statement from you. Yep. Uh, it is my point of view. 10% of total streaming viewing and Netflix is next at 75 so YouTube is viewed both on the big screen because of the NFL deal they've now done and because user-generated content on both mobile phones and on the connected television. I, I like data as much as the next person, Laura, but I, you can be a bit more romantic than that about, you know, <laughs> the, the products. So, so I, like, I'm a massive Rings of Power Romance. nerd. I, I, I'm a massive Rings of Power nerd, and I was trying to get Caroline into that. I, I don't know, what do you think? I, I, I find YouTube interesting, but I don't go there to watch the, the content that I'm super passionate about. And so is that the element that we'll start to see them bringing originals, bringing, I mean, at the moment it's user-generated content. We've got Amazon doing originals, movie making, they're also doing live sports. What will YouTube end up offering us? Well, I remember when Survivor first launched, which was the original reality programming, right. everybody yeah. said, this is junk, this is trash, this is never gonna catch on. You know, people who watch YouTube user-generated content think it's premium programming. You may not. <laughs> But it turns out it reaches global audiences. We're on YouTube. We're, we're yeah, premium no, I, programming. I, and full, <laughs> I, I really believe in YouTube, but I'm just talking about um, uh, in the evening when you go home after work and you want to watch a piece of television. I, I'm not going to YouTube, but uh, c carry on, please. I think anecdotal, not statistical. The statistics yeah. suggest that sort of everybody, I think something like 85% of consumers that watch video globally are on YouTube weekly. Right. So their data is really compelling on YouTube, I think. What's interesting, you mentioned Survivor. I'm actually having a conversation later <laughs> with unscripted executives for Peacock, and that's yeah. all about Love Island and traitors and the, the new age yes. of yeah. Survivor. Yeah. What then of the Peacocks? What then of the Paramounts? What then of the not key Disney, Netflix, Amazon, YouTube? So I just think we, we need to think about the job to be done. And the job to be done is to entertain consumers, yeah. all consumers globally. And s certainly some consumers will sit through two hour movies or one hour dramas or 30 minute sitcoms, but they'll also sit through 15 second TikTok videos or 30 second, three minute YouTube videos. I think all this content is better for consumers. It gives consumers more choice. This is Bloomberg technology. Let's bring this back to business. Sure. If you're an investor, how do you judge Netflix, Disney, and rank them? Is it the subscriber number? And mm. how closely are we paying attention to those big, big figure do dollar figures, right? 
and spending on content. Right. So I think what we need to look at, what the market cares about today, is return on invested capital, including your content capital. So right now, Netflix is the only streamer making money. Wall Street cares about that. Disney is recently, Disney streaming, has recently right. moved into profitability. And they're they, switching on those ads. They're switching on the ads and they're lowering their content costs. Right. So I do think that what we're seeing, and the problem is, it's not, Disney isn't pure play. What's happening in their parks margins is just yes. as important as what's happening in the streaming business. And they have linear TV. So ESPN is super important too when you look at NBA rights doubling uh, on the fees. Could we, we talk a bit about advertising? Mm, I, sure. I, I find the job of uh, your job really interesting because there's something that you can't model for, which is the psychology of a consumer. When I was a child, I watched ad ads on TV and it was normal. And there was a period of time during the pandemic where there were no ads. And then suddenly everyone started doing it and there was a, 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 a revolt but actually seems like it's working. Yep, I, and I think the consumer has to take, he has to judge his time as a valuable asset. So it's either free with ads, which means he's took your time. And because the, the streamers have much lower ad loads, four minutes, five minutes. Remember cable TV? It was like 14 minute ad loads. Yes. So much lower ad loads, so a lower price in a way for an hour of content. And I really like some of the innovations where they'll show you a video and then you get the next program for free. I love that because you get good attention to the ad and you get half an hour, an hour of free content. I think that's a great business model. You know, we were just talking last week about M&A out of necessity coming in cable TV land. Yes. Where wow. is the M&A going to start switching on for these content providers? Because we've been talking about it for years. Um, unfortunately, you need a different president. You need a different White House because the FCC, FTC and DOJ are all appointed by the person, by the party essentially in the White House. And right now under Democrats, m and is really, really hard because they believe big is bad. And so even these companies that really do need to merge and cut costs, what do they, do? they cannot so as long as there's a Democratic administration in the White House. Needham Senior Entertainment Analyst, Laura Martin. Uh, it's really fantastic to do this in person. You've been on Bloomberg Technology so many times. Well, keep coming um, back, please. Uh, and, and if you're just joining us, uh, this is Bloomberg Technology on the road in Hollywood at Bloomberg Screen Time. This is the coverage of popular culture. Yeah, this we're is talking the coverage of music, what? of streaming, but also of movie making, of podcasting. We've got it all coming up. And do not forget, video games. Oh yeah. There's something coming later <laughs> in the program video games and, and it's important because dollar for dollar it is comparable and important. Uh, we're having a lot of fun here. We will be right back. This is On the Road in Hollywood, Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to a very special edition of Bloomberg Technology. We are live from Bloomberg Screen Time, right here in the heart More of Los Angeles. More specifically, Hollywood. Yeah, we're in Hollywood, friends. And we're talking, therefore, content, creation, streaming. We were speaking in particular about Amazon adding mm. Apple TV Plus to its channel store in the US, offering hits, of course, like Ted Lasso, one that you love, Slow love Horses, it. in the video supermarket for the first time. I got to chat with Mike Hopkins last night. He's head of Amazon Prime Video and Amazon... MGM Studios. Just take a listen about the deal. What we've tried to become over the last four or five years is, you know, a first stop entertainment hub for consumers around the world. And what I mean by that is not only do we have the prime content that we talked about at the top, including Thursday Night Football, we have our fourth game of the season tomorrow night, uh, the NBA coming next year, NASCAR, but around the world we also have Champions League throughout Europe Ooh. and a variety of sports as well. Um, so we've got our prime programming. But we also offer the world's largest TVOD store, written by movies and TV shows in the world. Um, and then on top of that, we have over 100 partner streaming services that you can subscribe to right inside of our application. Um, and what we found is consumers, you know, if you think about the number of apps and subscriptions you have, it's kind of hard to keep track of it all. You're not yeah. sure exactly where that, that show or movie might be. Um, and so what we've noticed is people realize they can subscribe to Max or Paramount Plus or League Pass or uh, Crunchyroll, et cetera, inside of Prime Video, we see, a, uh, we see a lot more engagement. We are able to get subscribers for those, uh, those, those businesses at a real attractive rate. 
um, and it's an exciting part of our business. In fact, we, we're, um, we're going to announce tonight that we are adding Apple TV Plus to our Prime Video Channel's mm -hmm. uh, propositions uh, in the not too distant future. And, um, uh, Why? Why Apple TV Plus? Well, we, they have great programming, and yeah. you know we've had a good partnership with Apple on a number of fronts. But you know our companies do a lot of business together, and um, I want to thank Eddie Q, who I know isn't here tonight, but he, he and his team have done a great job with this deal, and we're excited to get it going. That was Mike Hopkins, head of Amazon Prime Video and Amazon MGM Studios. And Amazon putting Apple TV Plus in there, that is news. A shout out to Eddie Q. And a Come shout out to Eddie Q. In our world, that is news. Another player in the battle over streaming is pulling in tens of millions of viewers without charging them a thing. In the US, more than 81 million people stream content every month on Tubi, the free ad-supported platform which is owned by Fox. It's now expanding overseas with the service launching across the UK this summer, our original home. Uh, joining us now is 2B CEO Anjali Sood. Uh, it's great to see you. Thank the UK is an interesting market. Just explain the basics, why, and, and what's going to happen. Yeah, so uh, we've been getting incredible traction in the US. We just gave the numbers. Um, yeah, we're the uh, most watched free TV service in the US now. And what we're finding is that audiences, particularly cord cutters and cord nevers, they, they want to watch content for free, they don't mind watching ads in return, and they want a large collection of What was of the diverse... second term, sorry, cord cutter and... Cord nevers. I've not heard that. Oh, I think it's, yeah. a, it's almost it's like 25%. Gen Alpha, Gen Z. Yeah, uh, of, <laughs> of audiences not, that just, okay. it's not that they originally were subscribing to cable and stopped, it's that they're just, they never did never to begin it. with. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and, and what we're finding is that uh, Tubi has this incredible formula. We're free for consumers. We have the world's largest collection of movies and TV shows, and it's resonating with audiences. And we believe we can bring that same um, value proposition to UK audiences. We've done the same in Canada. We're doing the same in Latin America. Really, it's a global opportunity, and that's what we're looking to pursue. How does the content therefore evolve? Because do you therefore have originals made by the UK in the UK for the UK audience, or are they very much a global demand stream? So, Tubi has been able to successfully do a couple different things. One, we license and acquire content from really everyone. So we have this very vast uh, selection of opportunities and, and shows. We also have invested in originals. We have hundreds of originals. Nearly one in four Tubi viewers in the US watches an original. And so we will absolutely look to have One in four watches one of content. your originals. A Tubi it? original. A Tubi yeah. original. And what's really interesting about Tubi originals is they don't tend to be these big budget, um, originals that you might see on other streamers. Uh, what we often do is we will listen to what is resonating on our platform, okay. what our fans love, and then we'll go and look to acquire or produce content that really reflects something that they can't find anywhere else. We should probably talk about the Fox element of this. A lot of people are surprised by that. I, I think we were partly, how does that work? And, and I'm assuming that underpinning all of that is that if it's free for the consumer, it's, it's advertising. That, yeah. that you've got to make some money, right? Yeah, so we, uh, we only make money through advertising, uh, which we think really aligns incentives because uh, we only make money if our viewers are engaged, if they're actually watching content. Tubi is owned by Fox. It was acquired several years ago. It actually started in Silicon Valley over 10 years ago. Cool. Um, really interesting, Tubi started as an ad tech startup and then pivoted over time to be a consumer streaming service. And what that means is our DNA is very, very rich in using technology and data to personalize and offer a delightful experience. It's something I've been really impressed by, and I think it's a big differentiator right now because audiences also, they, they don't want barriers, they don't want friction, they want TV to feel fun again. So you raise a really good point on the technology. Uh, in our household, at least, I have a Roku TV and I have a Samsung Smart TV. On the Roku TV, it's an app-based system. On the smart TV, I can search for a specific show that I want to watch, and it might tell me that the only place I can find it is Tubi. But my goodness, have I got <laughs> options? And and I'll be honest, you know, I, my wife said to me the other day, you know, I didn't know we had Tubi, and I said, neither did I. Uh, <laughs> and and that mu you you must kind of recognise that a little bit. Absolutely, I think there is a paradox of choice, and I think we in the streaming ecosystem haven't yet really made it as easy for viewers as we need to. 
Tubi's approach is to be ubiquitous. So we are present um, and available and accessible to consumers across over 30 devices, every surface and screen that we can be on. Mm -hmm. And to your point, having that really large library means that we're often discoverable because we're the, we're the place you can watch that content you're looking for for free. And I think you're just gonna see us continue to do more and more to just remove barriers and make that experience easier and better. So your market share keeps on going up. I mean, you might not have been aware or using it, but 1.8% of the market is yours. Yeah. You're only just behind Peacock and Hulu. When are you gonna eclipse them? Well, honestly, you know, we're, we are very focused on playing one game and one game only, and that is being free, frictionless entertainment for consumers. But I, what I will say is we are doubling down on the strategy. We believe it's working. We think the tailwind's in our favor, and it's on us to continue to deliver. Where does live sports fit into your strategy? We are not uh, investing in premium live sports rights. Uh, that is that's very expensive, and our belief is that's not going to really work on a free ad-supported model the way it does in other models. But what you will see us do is partner with Fox Sports in particular right. to, to really tell stories in and around the culture of sports. An example is this week we announced a talk show with Deion Sanders, Coach, Coach Prime. Prime. Right. Um, you'll also see us do a purple carpet sort of pregame um, show before the Super Bowl this year that kind of talks about fashion and celebrity culture around the game and we'll continue to experiment there. But what we see particularly among younger viewers, Gen Z, is that they're very interested in stories and culture around sports almost as much as the live game itself. Yeah. Very briefly, do you want an Oscar? Do you want to like have an original make a big bang? I want to produce content that delights our viewers, and I would say we care a lot more about that. Engagement is our currency, probably above awards or anything else. Okay. Tubi, Anjali, Sid, so nice to have some time with you. We thank her. Meanwhile, coming up, we dive into your favorite, the gaming industry, folks. Mike Morheim's with us, the co-founder of Blizzard Entertainment. Boy, have we got some chats. He's now leading his own game developer startup and some new content coming. Uh, yeah, uh, it was a big part of my childhood, some of his work. I'm super excited. Last night, Snoop Dogg also sat down with Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw to discuss his new album, but also... My childhood, my childhood. Your childhood, but also, you probably saw it, his experience at the Olympics over the summer. Just check this out. The NBC was, and the Olympics was willing to allow us to bring our flavor to the table and not try to keep us in the box and let us, you know, season the meat. <laughs> Blizzard co-founder, industry veteran, Mike Morheim's working to replicate the video game studio's success, but without making some of the mistakes that have impacted the company's reputation in recent years in particular, and in particular the culture. Mike's new company is Dreamhaven. It is announcing a new title literally today. It has not said very much at all <laughs> since kind of starting in 2020, and I'm delighted to say that Mike's here with us in person. Thank you for We can me. go into the backstory of Blizzard, um, and, and we can go into how, for many people watching this show around the world, some of the original Blizzard titles in the I'm a Child of the 90s is, is a big part of their video games history. But let's start with what's new today, okay? You have a title out, Sunderfolk. It is the kind of big moment for your studio, which you founded in 2020. The basics of the game and why it's important, why it will stand out in this field. So, um, so yeah, this is a big moment for us because we've been heads down working on, uh, on two games internally at Dreamhaven through right. our Secret Door studio and Moonshot. So Secret Door just announced their first game. It's called Sunderfolk. It is a couch co-op tactical RPG um, adventure that you can play with your friends, really inspired by the magic of tabletop gaming. Um, and, and this is a 2025 thing, just to This is a 2025 up. thing. So we just revealed what we've been working on all of this time. And um, we're super excited about it. Um, some of the unique things about, about this game, it uses um, uh, two screens, a personal screen, uh, which is basically your phone in your pocket, and a shared screen. Um, and we're really trying to um, replicate the magic of tabletop um, and RPG adventure gaming um, without some of the 
barriers that really make it inaccessible to a lot of people. You what know, are the, the, barriers? Thick, the thick manuals, yeah. the setup time. If you look at some of these games, sometimes you're taking, um, you have to spend an hour learning the rules to teach your friends how to play the game. I mean, that is MMORPG classic. That's the point of it. <laughs> that is not the point of it. The okay. point is to get in and, and have fun. Agree to disagree. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, and have fun with your friends. And so we've really kind of um, streamlined that whole experience to try to make um, uh, game night accessible to more people and, so, and to also give tools to the people who are really passionate about this genre to be able to bring in their friends who may not um, have experienced the magic of tabletop games. building that in SoCal, and what's so interesting is this is a four-year project. You've been sort of in stealth. What is the heavy lift that goes in to bringing us Thunderfolk, to bringing us the yeah. other game that you've got lined up? Um, I think that, I mean, one of the big challenges, whenever you're doing something innovative that hasn't been done before, there's a lot of trial and error and iteration. Um, often you come up with a design, you think it's going to be great, and then when you actually start playing it, you find that there are a lot of things that maybe aren't working as well as you thought or aren't as fun as you thought. And so yes. it's just very iterative to go and um, try things, play them, and then uh, and then evolve. And sometimes you have to make big course corrections or pivots along the way. Who are you trying to build games for? Who's your demographic? We're trying to go for a really broad audience. So we try to make games that have um, depth for um, a lot of replayability and for people who really want to, um, who are really familiar with these genres, are with you? accessibility, so that um, even if you're not familiar, like it's me? really, yeah, I, I would love for you to play our games. <laughs> It's, it would be an interesting experiment to yeah. do that, right? To play together. I mean, if you're just tuning in, this is Bloomberg Technology in Hollywood for Screen Time, and, and Mike Morheim and his colleagues are, are the people behind Diablo and Warcraft and those games in the 90s, 2004 Warcraft rethink subscription model. I mean, yeah. you, were, you, you were behind it and then skeptical about how that would grow. Um, let's put that to one side because it isn't the 90s or 2000s anymore. It seems to me really hard to run an independent game studio and publishing shop right now. How hard? Well, game development has always been very difficult. Um, in our experience, um, I, I don't think there's ever been a project that has sort of like, we know what we're making, we go and make it, and it's just great. It just always has these um, zigs and zags along the way, and I think where we've been successful is really being um, reactive to um, what the games have told us that they need in order to achieve their potential. Um, and we always have gone through a process where we um, continue to bring in fresh people with fresh perspectives yes. to experience the game and observe how they interact with it, where are they getting stuck, what doesn't make sense, and try to really streamline that onboarding. Mike, let's talk about this industry. Um, the, the backstory is that Blizzard uh, merged with Activision. I just want to ask that at the conclusion of, of Activision being acquired by Microsoft, how you feel that left the industry, what the significance of, of it was for video games. I think we don't know the answer to that yet. I, th I think it's still early um, because you're going to have to see um, how um, how Blizzard is able to operate within that new environment yes. and um, whether uh, it's an environment that will still allow it to continue innovating. We referenced it at the start. You built a legendary business in gaming that many people grew up with. It's hard running businesses. What are the lessons you learned from Blizzard that you're either bringing over or not doing in the new industry? Yeah, that you want to avoid the mistakes of the past on. Yeah, so I mean, that's two parts. I think some of the things we are definitely we want to bring over is we think that, um, look, g gaming is a very competitive business. There's something like 15,000 games that are releasing each year on Steam alone. Um, and so in order to sort of stand out, you really have to do something different, better. Um, and so really having a focus on creating high quality experiences, we really believe in the power of gaming to bring people together and that's what motivates us. And so I think we, we are always thinking about um, how to make the 
games as good as they can be with um, a, a view on what the players, what we as players want to see from those games. And I think that that's kind of, we just always want to keep that, that mindset. Um, I think, you know, with Dreamhaven, one of the things we want to do, we want to create an environment that allows individuals to do their best work. Right. So, um, and to feel like, and to, to have these studios feel like they're in control of their destiny um, and to feel agency right. and responsible for that so that they can, you know, steer their ship in, in the, right, the right ways. So. Mike, it's been so good having you. Thank you very much. Dreamhaven CEO with a new title, Mike Rohheim. We thank him. Coming up, we're going to be diving deep into Blizzard Entertainment and its past as well, a new book out on it. This is Bloomberg Technology. Let's recap. For video game fans, Blizzard Entertainment was a household name. The maker of Overwatch and World of Warcraft changed the video game landscape until corporate parent Activision started cracking down on Blizzard's autonomy. We've just been speaking with one of the executives at the heart of the story, and it was all chronicled in a new book, Play Nice, The Rise, Fall and Future of Blizzard Entertainment, which just came out this week. Author and Bloomberg News reporter Jason Schreier is here with us in Hollywood. I'm here. Hello, Ed. Uh, Caroline, it's great to be here. I was going over with Mike some of the history of Blizzard. I was a child of the 90s, the titles. Your book goes inside the company. What was happening in the 90s, 2000s? Where would you like to start and it's, what's inside the pages? It's really two stories. It's a story. It's a culture story and a business story. And right. in both, they go in some wild directions. You see, uh, the book traces the history of Blizzard from 1991, when it was founded, all the way up until today, when it was bought by Microsoft in a $69 billion acquisition. Still kind of unfathomable, right? Guys? right. Like, it's still unimaginable that that happened. And what I do is I trace the culture, the way uh, that people treated the place, the way the company, um, what it was like to work there. So really quick, good culture or bad culture? I, I, I try not to be reductive because for a lot of people it was really good, for a lot of people it was really bad, for a lot of people it was both. A lot of um, women, for example, there have been a lot of discussions about how Blizzard treated women in the wake of this big mm. lawsuit that hit the company. Um, a lot of women felt like at times it was the best place in the world and at times it was just really awful and they were treated uh, they were harassed, they were discriminated against. But sometimes, I mean, uh, one woman I talked to told me that she met some of her best friends in the world, people who were in her wedding party at right. Blizzard. Yeah. But at the same time, she had to deal with like getting paid less than her male colleagues. Well, look, Mike Morheim has now built his new venture with his wife yep. and is many ways trying to push against some of the tougher experiences he had build in a new way. What are the lessons being learned by the industry right now? Yeah, it's funny. I actually went and visited mm. their studio last night, and I think it's really interesting. One thing that really struck me about Dreamhaven, their new venture, is that they have about 37% of their employees identify as either women or non-binary, as opposed to a company like Blizzard, when, when they were founded, it was 0%, essentially. Maybe they were lucky to get one or two women over the course of the 90s. Of course, the entire video game industry was in a very different place back that. But um, now I think they're working hard to be more inclusive. I think a lot of game companies, I mean, it's like very slow, gradual steps towards not not being sexist and not being like crummy toward your workers. But um, they are making progress. And you know what? I think a lot more people these days are willing to call out companies that don't treat them well. And I think that has led to some changes. And just one point. We're here talking about this because video games industry is a huge industry. And Bigger I just than think, the movies. And it's, it's important to always remind ourselves of that. It's a key screen <laughs> that we're all addicted to, the gaming screen. Jason's sure going to be here at Screen Time doing an interview, I'm sure. Yes, I'm talking to Mike Morheim, actually. I get him after you guys. Um, there we have it. But this whole day is going to be amazing. There's going to be so many people you want to be listening from. Scooter Braun's going to be here. You're going to hear, of course, the CEO of Comcast coming on. You don't want to miss what's going on. And tomorrow, Long Beach, we are talking defense. We're talking space. We are live from Rocket Lab. Do not miss that Bloomberg technology. See you soon.